exciting time. This is our first session of uh, our study on Mere Christianity, written by C.S. Lewis. If you are streaming with us, welcome. Uh, we are glad to have you. We have a full um, class here today, and so um, we are going to do our best uh, because this class is is going to be a majority of discussion today. We'll mostly be, you know, lecture and some discussion. But starting from here, this point forward, the class is really going to be based on questions that have come out of the reading that we're going to discuss together. Um, and so we will do our best to speak loudly, and uh, so you can hear us all the way wherever you are. Um, and uh, but it's going to be a fantastic class. So uh, before we get uh, started, let's begin with really prayer. Father God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for loving us in such a way that you saw us in our deep need. You saw us um, as lost, and you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, to give his life for us so that we could be saved, so that we could be the righteousness of Christ. He took our sin and became sin. The righteous for the unrighteous. Father, we thank you for all of these that are here today. Father, I, I pray that this is a profitable discussion and a, a profitable time of teaching and learning. Father, we do love you, and we want to spread your word. Help us to learn how. Help us to do it with passion, but most of all, help us to know that our trust is not in ourselves, but it's in you. It is you who gives us the words and the truth uh, to do so. So in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You uh, first take your uh, take your your uh, workbook here that we put together. If you are going to be streaming with us, if you want a workbook, and uh, yeah, it's yeah. And, and by the way, it's like 80 degrees in our classroom. So God bless all of these uh, wonderful, warm-blooded people. Uh, we're gonna try to do better. Um, uh, if you are going to be streaming and you want a workbook, um, hit me up and uh, let me know. Shoot me a text so I'll know how many I need to make. Um, and uh, and make sure we have those. Um, so grab your uh, grab your little workbook there. And the first thing I want you to notice is the cover. All right, look at the cover. All right, there's the book. There's the nice latte or coffee, and, and there's a there's a blankie there. So so that is how I expect you to read. The only thing I would add to that is a pen and your own little workbook. All right, because you're going to want to write things down as you go. Okay, um, I have a quote on my wall. Now I have multiple quotes by C.S. Lewis. Um, um, decoupage on on pieces of wood, put on my wall. But one of my favorites is there is no there is no cup of tea that is big enough, and no book that is long enough for me. You know, and uh, I wish I was that guy. Um, but uh, but he was so um, anyway. So it's going to be a fun a fun study. Uh, on the inside, there's a uh, kind of a a a, uh, a summary, a little bit about the book uh, Near Christianity. It says based on a series of BBC radio talks he made during World War II. All right, somebody put some dates for me on World War II. That happened when. There you go. Yeah, the early 40s, right? And so this was a, a series of BBC talks during the 40s. Lewis wrote this book to explain and defend the mere essence of Christianity, the basic tenets held by all Christians. It's four sections, or books, in succession, um, present a moral argument for the existence of God, explain why the Incarnation makes Christianity unique, describe how Christians should live as a result, and affirm the ultimate goal of the triune God is not to make better men, but completely new ones. 
And that last phrase is so vitally important for us today. Not just better men and women, by the way, right. <laughs> but completely new ones. Okay? Um, you know, Christianity provides an articulate expression of the intelligent case for Christianity, but retains the conversational style from the original radio talks on which it is based. Lewis focuses on the core issues of Orthodox Christianity without getting into some of the controversial and divisive issues that exist between traditions. It is important to note that Lewis uses mere in the original sense of pure or unmixed. Okay? Um, and then there is the schedule that we're going to be working at. Um, if we only went one chapter at a time, we would be in mere Christianity for um, 30 weeks or so because we couldn't actually get through an entire chapter on each time as the way we work on things. So um, we're going to go after for 13 weeks and um, two at the least three sections at the most, I believe, um, and then you will see if you flip the page, well, flip a couple of pages, three or so pages or more, anyway, okay, the Mere Christianity Study Guide Session 2, you will notice that we start with the Law of Nature, book one. And then, or chapter one, um, and you will notice questions under there. Okay, as you're reading, answer those questions. Okay, that is going to be the class. All right, that is going to be the class. The discussion of those questions um, between each other and us hashing those out and what Lewis means. Um, now, I want to go back to, in essence, the why this class, okay? Well, let me ask this first. Um, what do we know about C.S. Lewis? What do you know? He was an atheist. He, he began as an atheist, right? No, no. I, I, I may be wrong, but um, his mother was very, very ill when he was very, very young, and and he prayed and prayed and prayed that she would get well. So I don't think he was an atheist then, but she died, and boy, that did it. Yes, <laughs> correct. Yes, yes. So he believed that God wasn't listening, and therefore, out of hurt and anger and Didn't all of that, him. left. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. What else do you know? He was a professor. He was an extremely intelligent. And was looked up by his people as uh, someone to admire and to listen to. Um, so he was a man that, uh, all right, if you're getting ready to get in a debate with somebody, you might as well go ahead and get ready. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Cambridge professor, um, absolutely. Um, what else do we know? Um, yeah, highly intelligent. Um, what else do we know about C.S. Lewis? I know he was married later in life. Mm -hmm. What one of the things you always do is read her voice and read Promise of the Dawn. Yes. Yes, he was married, and it's a beautiful story. Um, Bob was over for dinner the other night. We talked about the, the movie and also the book that the movies are, are based on Shadowlands. And has anybody watched the movie Shadowlands? Okay. There's two of them, Bob, let us know. I didn't know. There's one with Anthony Hopkins and Deborah Winger. That's the newer one. And then there's an older one that we have not watched yet. But it's about um, it's about C.S. Lewis meeting Joy and it, later in life. Who, and he marries her. And then, I don't want to, you know, spoiler alert, I'm not going to give you the, the ending. Um, but then he also, based on that, also wrote another book called A Grief Observed which is him going through some major struggles with his faith um, during that time. But um, anyway, so highly recommend that. Um, also, um, what else do we know about C.S. Lewis? 
was walking in the woods with Tolkien, and Tolkien turned around and said, what if it's true? Mm -hmm. And that started everything. Yes, he was friends with J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I was worried. I was worried. Um, <laughs> yes, he was friends. Um, they had a group, they had a writer's group called the Inklings, and they would meet. Um, they were all Cambridge and Oxford guys, um, along with uh, Dorothy Sayers was, uh, was, a, was a, a kind of a loose part of that. Um, they would meet at a pub called the Eagle and the Child, um, or affectionately known as the Bird and the Baby. And they would talk about what they were writing. And at some point, J.R.R. Tolkien asked C.S. Lewis, he said, he said, what if you're wrong? What if it actually is true? And so to that point, he began to say, well, I can fix this, because I can prove you wrong. And in fact, he proved himself wrong. Uh, there's also a new movie out um, called The Reluctant, The Most Reluctant Convert. Um, and it talks about his process of going from non-belief to belief. And uh, it's, it's very well done. And Max McLean, um, who plays C.S. Lewis on stage all the time, um, plays that. Um, I, I commend to you anything and everything C.S. Lewis has written. I love his fiction. Um, that was my first introduction to C.S. Lewis, was my brother bringing the Chronicles of Narnia home from the school library um, and reading it to me, because we all shared a room until he went off to college, um, reading it to me as a little kid before we went to bed. And so that was my first introduction, and then I read all of them later in life. My third grade teacher read um, in, uh, in Greenville, uh, Mrs. Hester, uh, read the Cron uh, read um, the Lion, Witch, the Lion and the Witch and the Wardrobe to us as a child, and, and it began my love of reading fantasy, and then, of course, C.S. Lewis. Um, that all being said, um, why should we study this book now? This was written in the 40s. Why in the world would we study this book today in 2022, July of 2022? Why is this an important study? Because it's even more relevant today than it was back then. Yes. For the United States of America, this book is vitally important. Uh, as you read the the uh, the uh, uh, forward and the introduction, uh, one of the things that C.S. Lewis says is he is writing and and speaking to a post-Christian Britain. Okay, a post-Christian Britain. And now, when was that written, or when when was it? It's in the forties. So at that point, C.S. Lewis is already saying, we are post-Christian. Um, the U.S., in case you're wondering, uh, more and more and more people do, are, do not look towards Christianity to have the answers anymore. That's not the first place to go anymore. Um, and that's one of the ideas behind post-Christian, or we sometimes, you, you've heard the term post-modern. Um, which means there's no, ultimately, it, it's very uh, simmered down here, ultimately no single truth, okay? Um, very relevant for today, okay? Very, very relevant for us to dive in. Now, here's the other part of that. When I, when I say things like that, you know, you hear in the background, bah, 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 bah. Bah, bah, right? Um, you know, the whole imperial march of Darth Vader showing up or, or whoever, you know, and you see that. But what, what is the idea here? It's that Christ is still going to be victorious, right? We don't have to be afraid. There's some concerning things. There's some hard things about the world in which we live. And, and the Lord that we love, that people no longer look to to have the answers. 
But here is the truth of the matter. If we read scripture, we read the prison epistles. And where is Paul when he's writing the prison epistles? <laughs> Good job. You context clues. Way to go. Um, yeah, he's in prison. And what is he writing about in Philippians? Joy. Right? Man, that's what I want. And by the way, one of C.S. Lewis's books, Surprised by Joy. Now, that's, that's awesome because his wife's name was Joy. And, uh, and so that was, you know, uh, double, double meaning there. Um, for us, as followers of Jesus Christ, there is no joy like the joy that comes from the Lord. There's no confidence like the confidence that comes from the Lord. Okay? And so what our goal in this uh, class for these next 13 weeks is to boil down ask the question, what do Christians believe? Okay? What is the fundamentals that we believe, that we call? Now, there's a lot that we could, that we could have discussion about in traditions and other things like that, but for the most part, it is so important for us to go back to kind of this near Christianity, original um, idea um, Kind of boil down what do we believe and therefore based in that how do we live there does that make sense any questions before we jump into kind of the introduction any thoughts well what's great about Lewis the fact that he is so human and he wrestles with what he wrestles with <laughs> and being so intellectual He's got a bigger problem. I mean, if I was that intellectual, you're batting back and forth and debating yourself, and you're beating yourself up until you finally come with a conclusion. But for those people that are not intellectual, it, it, the fact is, it, it's not the trail is not as, as bad. Sometimes yeah. it's good not to be that intellectual. <laughs> Yes. Sometimes it's okay to be done with a bag of hammers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and but that is true. One of the one of my favorite things about mere Christianity is that Lewis does such an amazing in his battle to to not only come to faith, but in his battle to to bring his faith into words, he has some of the best metaphors and how I can understand. And I use them all the time. I mean, I, I, and, and my goodness, if you've ever sat at my preaching, I, almost every sermon, I have at least one C.S. Lewis quote or one C.S. Lewis metaphor. And some of this you're going to read and say, wait a minute, Karen said that. He didn't say that. That was C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and, and it happened to be one of those moments in which I channeled C.S. Lewis and didn't give him credit. Um, okay. So, so this idea of boiling it down. Um, if you look on the first page there, where it says it's the Mere Christianity Study Guide, Session 1, we're going to talk about uh, places in Scripture where Paul and, the, and, and others in Scripture boiled it down and said, here are the fundamentals, here's, here's what's really important. This is not all of them, but, but here is what is really important. So Paul, at the end of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, he said this, For I deliver to you as of first importance, okay? So this idea, what is Paul doing? Um, he is triaging theology, okay? So last night, my son-in-law Gavin cut his, uh, one of his toes, ended up going to the emergency room, okay? He cut his toe, went to the emergency room, had to get stitches. So what if somebody walked in to the emergency room going, who goes first? That guy. That guy. What do we call that? Triage. Triage, right? So there are some things that are more important than other things. All right? So that's what Paul is saying here. There, for I deliver to you as of first importance, 
the most important, okay? Um, what I also receive, and so here he goes, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, okay? Right there, what is Paul talking about? Who Christ is and what else? What he did. What he did and what scripture is, right? So right there, we see that, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. By the way, who is Cephas? Peter. Peter. There you go, Peter. Yeah, then to the twelve. Uh, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So Paul is here saying these things are important, right? These are, this is a first starting place, okay? Uh, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Paul boils it down again. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Kind of this basic idea of, of if you have any questions about what Christianity is about, if you're at, sitting at church and you're wondering what, what is important, you might go down and go, okay, what does he mean by each of those things? Okay? Um, my favorite is John 1, 1 through 18. I've often said uh, every, so much is in Job, but if you look at Job and then you look at John 1, 1 through 18, there's a ton of stuff you need to know in John 1, 1 through 18. Uh, we're going to hit it quickly. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own. Own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son. From the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. Um, for from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Right? John boiling it down. Right? And he's going, he's going, in essence, this is the introduction to everything I'm just about to say. And if you go through the Gospel of John, you look and you and you go back to that preamble of the gospel and you look and you say, Oh yeah, that's what he was doing, right? He's totally going through that. Um, now, not only scripture, and there's other places that we can go, but church fathers have also sought to boil down fundamental truths, okay? And we see that in one of the oldest creeds, 
Uh, by the way, what, what does creed mean? Yeah, believe, right? Believe or, uh, or, or teaching, okay? Uh, uh, you know, I believe, I creed, okay? Um, so the Apostles' Creed, and the reason, by the way, why it is called the Apostles' Creed is it's, it is seemingly the oldest one to be found, to, be, to, to have been written. Now, okay, um, when we talk creeds, what's the difference between a creed and scripture? Creed is man-made. Yeah, it's written by men. But why are, are the creeds beneficial? The good creeds, let me say it that way. Why are the good creeds beneficial? Summarizing. It's summarizing basic Christian thought. Okay? Right? It's summarizing basic Christian thought. Right? The Apostles' Creed, one of the uh, uh, ones that is used uh, many times that you, you may have been familiar with, says this I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic. All right, pause. What does Catholic mean? Universal. Universal. Okay, very good. Not not Roman Catholic Church, all right? Um, okay, if it was Roman Catholic Church, it would be a capital C. All right, so the Holy Catholic Church, Universal Church, right? Um, the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Um, I think pretty much um, Christians can say, yeah, we, we creed that. We, we believe that. Yeah. Um, another uh, creed, the following one, a, a little bit longer, um, a little more detailed, the Nicene Creed. By the way, these were put together at different conferences. Yes, in the early days of, of church fathers, yes, they had big conferences and people would come down and they would duke it out over over um, scripture and over what you know what what we believe as Christians and all of this stuff. All right, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Now. If you watch and you go through and you start reading some of the creeds, you see what are the questions that they're asking or that they're answering, right? And so, um, and so you, we keep coming back to this idea of what are the questions that are being answered. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, True God from true God. Begotten, not made. Do you hear the question that they're answering? In the deity of Christ. Right? Who is Jesus? Right? Is he really God? Right? Begotten, not made. Of the same essence as the Father. Through him, all things were made. By the way, where does that come from? John. The Gospel of John. Yeah, very good. Uh, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. By the way, if you're in my Sunday morning class, we're talking about that. We talked a little bit about that as we talked about the Trinity. 
and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal, Catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of the sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. All of those, okay? Now, are, are creeds on the same level as, as Scripture? No. Of course not. Of course not. Are my sermons on the same level as Scripture? No. no. Of course not. Right up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am right now. Now, what is my goal? What is my goal? Uh, what is William's goal, right? To rightly divide the Word of God. To not speak error. But, but we are men, right? We are men who are fallible. But the Word of God is infallible, infallible and inerrant. Good job. Well done. So our goal in this is for us to do a study. First to ask, what do I and what should I? Now, here's what I want you to write on the graffiti wall in the back of your mind. Okay, you ready? And how do I use the truths of Scripture in my day-to-day -day walk? In my family? In my neighborhood? that are placed in front of me at the share center at my place of work and you fill in the blank alright we just read a ton of stuff I'm going to pause for a minute what sticks out to you in all of that that we just read Jesus Christ. Gospel. Yeah. The story of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Absolutely. Um, yeah. The foundation of Christianity is in the Word, right? I mean, my, my literature and my English teachers always said, you know, when we were defining terms, right, you can't use the Word in the, in the uh, definition. Uh, with Christianity, you can't not use the word, the root, in the, in the term, of, in the definition of Christianity, right? It has to be there, right? The foundation of Jesus Christ and what he has done. Absolutely. Yeah. There is no gospel without Christ and without him being who God um, would be. Without him being God and fully human. Yeah. Anything else stick out? Anything? Does that make you think of anything? It strips it down to the very basics of Christian belief mm -hmm. without adding in our traditions of different denominations or you know different churches. Mm -hmm. So it's taking out it's taking all of the, the man-made rules within the church or traditions within the church out of it and saying bottom line what is important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um are there, by the way, are traditions important? Absolutely. Sure they are, right? Sure they are. Um, but also, when we go back to our concept of triage, why did Gavin get pushed to the back of the line? Right? His cut toe, though important to him, especially to him, right? He wanted his stitches. Um, and not as important as somebody's heart. Stopping, right? What's a life and death? Correct. Correct. Who Jesus is is life and death, right? Fundamental basics of those things, right? Um, and then we go from there. And there are traditions within Scripture 
um, that God says, yeah, you need to be about these. What are our, our big two? And, and one was definitely mentioned. Um, one was not. But what are our, our two big things that we do on a regular basis as a, as a church? You know. There you go. Yeah, the two ordinances that are things like Bible ordinances. And they said you need to be about these, right? Do these things, right? Um, absolutely. Okay. For me, I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. By the way, what does Bible stand for? Anybody know? Uh -huh. Doesn't really stand for this, but... <laughs> I was <laughs> like... So you're thinking way too hard. <laughs> it means book, right? Yeah, yeah. It means book, yes, thank you. Uh, basic instructions before leaving earth. There you go. That's it. I knew I heard it before. Just kidding. Before it was. leaving Earth. All right. There you go. You can take that with you. That's free. Uh, T-shirt. Um, yeah. So, so that idea of scripture, trust scripture. Why else do we believe? Many, many gospel preachers and teachers and people have influenced our lives by their life, and they've shown us. Absolutely. So the word, the body of believers, right? Um, I think even if you put yourself away from scripture, even though I believe everything in there, um, one of the things that I learned the first time I read Mere Christianity when he talks about we all have some sort of a um, thing we ought to do with built within all humanity. lady, an older lady's crossing the road, your choices are stop and help her, ignore her, or rear off the road and run over her. Well, no one would say number three is a good idea. Why? Why would we all agree that's not a good idea? Outside of the Bible saying so, we, there's something within us that says we ought to do this or ought not. Well, because of that, there has to be an ought giver. Where did that come from? You know, our friend from Vietnam who grew up Buddhist, but she's looking waterfall going something had to make that you know there's something bigger than me so I think even outside of scripture it just makes sense that there's just something bigger outside of us and my goodness to live we've seen people who live without the hope of Christ I would not want to live that way just to live without that hope of, of eternal life and that this is the pain in this life is not all for nothing and the joy in this life that we for a reason too. So there's a good purpose. And it gives life meaning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why we're here. Yes. And that's what I love about the book. <coughs> is because we, we are all believers in the Bible. But to someone who's not a believer in the Bible, you can't say, well, the Bible says this. Right. Who cares? I don't believe what the Bible says. But when you can talk about God outside of the Bible <coughs> in a reasonable, logical way to go, Okay, now that makes sense. I can I can understand that, and then that often hopefully will lead to a belief in the Bible and relationship with God. Good, good. 
Bonnie, you were going to say something. Well, we all believe something, and we all live by a creed. And <coughs> to be honest, in that, seeking and searching and studying and learning is an important thing to do. And when you seek, you find. And um, that's why so many atheists have studied themselves into Christianity. <coughs> and really, anyone who, would, who has taken, you know, Joshua Bell, I mean, there's a list of thousands of the years who've studied themselves into, not out of belief. So it best describes <coughs> humanity, best describes me, best describes, you know, every part of the people, best describes <coughs> the flesh. And it, the Lord tells us that eternity is set in the hearts of men. And we are going to have a belief about that. So to me, it's um, emotionally, mentally, logically, always best described. And then just too, when you come to know God personally, <coughs> there's also just a knowing, you know, that goes beyond logically, well, this makes more sense. We have experience with God. He's walked us through sorrow. He's, so then we, we know in a different way. Yeah. Bounce off of what, um, what Bonnie said and uh, what others have, have said and alluded to. Well, let me ask this. How many theologians do we have in the room? Raise your hand if you're a theologian. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Every single one of us are a theologian. We are theologians. Um, because, and not because of what Bonnie said, but alluding to what Bonnie said, we all believe in something. And in fact, we have faith in something. Years ago, when I was interning, um, there was a young man that I never saw at church. That was one of the young men that went to church, or went, his family went to church. That he spent pretty much all of his time working on his car. All of his time working on his car. Didn't do any youth group stuff. Didn't come to church. Spent all of his free time. He worked, made money, and put it into, I think it was a, a, like a mid-80s Monte Carlo, okay? That had a big engine, and he spent all of his time, and he finally gets it finished, takes it out, and a guy runs a red light, T-bones him, and it totals his car, and he had no insurance. So he comes back to the guy who was the youth minister, and he said, he, he in tears, he said, I realize I've wasted four years of my life. What was this young man's faith in? The zero skill. Yeah. His car, right? Yeah. He, he worshipped, right? Because the definition of worship is, in essence, in essence, right? You're giving up something. You're giving power to something else, right? You're saying, this is bigger than me. And so I'm going to lay down everything for that, right? Now, um, all of us are theologians. One of the things that C.S. Lewis does, which he does so well, is he helps us to ferret out what do we really believe in? What are we really trusting in? By the way, that's also what Scripture does. It helps us to see what are we really trusting in. And so all of us are theologians. And the question is, what is God? Right? Who is God? Right? It may be just yourself. By the way, if it's not the one true God, there's always an aspect of self over there, right? And that's idolatry. We, we love to make idols in the image of ourselves and we go, oh, we know we you and bow, bow down to them. Um, Martin Luther himself said, said, uh, said, I am an idol factory and I crank them out every day. You know, my, my, uh, my, 
my, my short version of what you said. But, uh, but we have to be able to find and ferret out what our idols are, and that is one of the things that we're going after here. Um, the aspect of, uh, of being able to talk to people from a position of love and compassion and intelligently about Christianity is becoming more and more and more relevant. that is a true statement or is that a false statement? That's a true statement. Okay, why? Um, well, I think I said in a small group maybe a year or so ago um, at work I'm the, only, I'm the only Christian and I was just amazed. I mean, nobody goes to church and so if you start talking to people I've had responses like, well, um, I'm spiritual, but I just don't go to the mm. church. And I think I asked you one time, how do I, re how do I react to that? I mean, um, the world is not what it was when I was a child, and it's scary. I think you said earlier something about it being scary. It's scary to me. By the way, is this just a young person's problem? They're the person. Yeah. And that, for in my head, it's, it's odd for me to see people that are 65, 70, 75 years old who haven't gone to church in 25 years and really don't believe. That, that's surprising to me, right? They have no need. They have told me, oh, yeah, I don't have any need whatsoever for that. Um, and I try to gently, graciously, firmly push back because that's what I do. Um, but at the same time, it is a, a national world problem. And one of the reasons that Lewis wanted to speak on the BBC during World War II was that it is a time of crisis. And he wanted people to know that there was hope, but not just hope in the British Army or hope in winning or, or whatever it was or hope in the stuff that they have lost through the Blitzkrieg, but there is hope beyond hope. And that is the secret that we have, is this idea of hope beyond hope. And now the question then becomes, how do we express that to others? And this is going to help us do some of that. Um, do you believe that the church is giving people the hope what's hope? Um, I think the church um, is is trying. Um, do we do, can we do better? Of course we could, right? Of course we could. We could. Um, <clears throat> there is only one ultimate hope, and it is in Jesus Christ. Um, I think the church at times. Um, has bowed to a uh, to an aspect of forgetting what is the ultimate hope, and in, in C.S. Lewis's words, just trying to create better men and women, right? Um, and forgetting that how does that happen? That happens by new birth, right? And by discipleship and by trusting and following Jesus. So I think we we we. We are trying. I think all of us can do better, and that includes me. Um, of how do we get that out, and how do we get that moving? Um, yeah. Do, do those um, fifty-five and sixty-five and seventy-five-year-old people who haven't been to church in twenty-five years do they think there's a life after death, or do they just say, "I'm going to be gone"? I, I, I don't understand that. Really. Most of the time, it comes down to, well, if there is a life of, after death, then I'm good enough, then I'll make it. I'm um, a good guy. I'm a good dude. Yeah, I'm a good guy. And so I always have to say, really? Have you ever told a lie? Right? Have you ever stolen anything in all of your life? 
did you ever talk back to your mother? You know, did you, right? And so we, we use the law. And, and then, of course, we have to also say, me too, the difference between me and you is Jesus, right? And, and, and I don't say it that way, right? Yeah. See you, see me, see the difference, you know? <laughs> I don't do that. But at that same time, going, you know, at least throwing a rock in their shoe and making them walk around on it, of pushing back against that. Because, again, um, it's not about being better. It's about being made new. Right? And that, I think that is key. And I think that is really key for Texas. <laughs> right? Where we're tough. Right? We're tough. We have John Wayne Faith, even though he was from California. Um, <laughs> by the way, I stood, literally stood on his grave. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, Marion, what was his name? Marion. Anyway, yeah. um, you can't have a cowboy named Marion, by the way. Um, and, and, and so we, you know, we, we we are secure in our land holdings and our cool stuff and our big houses. We are secure, right? We we're good, right? I'm good, right? We say that all the time. I'm good. And, and at times, I want to go every time I hear it. And by the way, I say that too. Oh yeah, I'm good. And, and somebody needs to say, you are not, you're a liar, you're a thief, and you're only good because Jesus is good, right? And because of what he's done, right? Um, and so, anyway, I, yes. Maybe we, should be, maybe, maybe we should be talking about hell these days. No, no, yeah. I mean, it's pretty hot outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you get that point across? Yeah, and, and that is a great point. And the beauty of that um, is I think Lewis gets into this and he begins saying some things I think that are vitally important for us to grab a hold of is, um, you know, because the other side is we just beat people, right? We just beat people, we abuse people, and if we make them feel bad enough, they will actually feel like they've gone to church. Um, I had a guy one time <laughs> that that I want to actually feel like I've gone to church. I said, well, what do you mean by that, Joe? There's nobody here, by the way. Okay. <laughs> what do you mean by that, Joe? He said, I want to I want to walk out feeling bad for what I've done. I said, well, okay. Um, don't you already? If you're a Christian, it's not hard to go. Wow. That's why anytime I hope. My prayer is anytime that I preach, at some point in that we are exalting Christ for what he has done. Right? You know, by the way, that's a message that no matter who can listen to and go and go, wow, praise God for what he's done because I, I don't measure up. Don't we already know that? We don't measure up. If we do think we do measure up, there might be a problem. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, sir. I think we get into the habit of wanting people to believe in the same way we believe. In other words, both of these creeds basically said the same thing. And they're both true. But then we have a tendency, but yeah, but you don't believe this, so you must not be a Christian. Or you don't believe that, so you must not be a Christian. You use musical instruments, you must not be a Christian. How many things do we add on to what the basic beliefs are, and we use that to determine if someone is a Christian or not. We need to get away from that. Yeah, I, you know, one of my prayers in general, and I believe what is happening with the transition of culture in the U.S. and, and, and especially even here in, uh, in our state and in our area, that is what is being forced to happen is that we start when someone says, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. And we start there and go, oh, praise God, there's another one. <laughs> right? Because that's what we learned when we moved to California. In California, we did not expect people to be Christian or to know anything about it. Right? We had a mosque. We had uh, a Hindu monastery. We had two um, Jewish churches. Um, we had uh, Mormon, uh, Jesus Christ.
Christ of the Latter, 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 Latter Day Saints, right? The Jehovah's Witness place. Uh, and within, okay, get this, within about 10 blocks of our house. Right? And so when I'm sitting in the dentist office or wherever and, and someone is reading their Bible, I'm like, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> I never walk up to someone and say, how you doing? <laughs> but, but, how do you do you, you know, and, and really that idea of Philip who runs up to the Ethiop Ethiopian unit, and what did Philip say? Do you understand, you understand what you're reading that? Hey, why are you reading that? And of course they, they look up and they're going, uh, I'm going to get beaten, <laughs> right, by someone. So, man, that's awesome. I go to so-and-so church and they're like, oh, you go to church? <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, we're running there. You understand what I mean? Um, and so what is the dividing line? The dividing line isn't going to be some of these little things. And, and they're big things for tradition, okay? I get it. I, and we have big preferences and all of that. It's big stuff, okay? And, and it's scary and all of that. But I'll tell you, uh, we are looking for the people who have the aroma of Christ. And then we are two things, and I'm going to stop here. Um, I thought I was going to stop early, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> what is the church? The church is an army, and the church is a hospital. It's both, right? It's a mash unit. church when I was five, and I stopped going when I was seven, but those folks said, yeah, I'm going to let you choose, and so I've never gone back since then. Really? Well, well tell me about the rent. You know, what, so what do you think about, you know, so, so how does your life work? You know, how does that, what, what rules your life? It's not offensive, is it? Now, there comes a point when I have to be offensive. Now, I, I find myself being more offensive with Christians than I do with non-Christians, with people that say, I'm a Christian. I go, man, you gotta live, you know, you're not living that way, right? It doesn't look right, right? Anyway, final thought, 30 
30 seconds. All right. It's been good to be with you today. And uh, so what's next? Read the intro, the prelude, the front cover, the back cover, the all that stuff. And uh, chapters one and two and answer your questions. Um, somebody once asked me, why do I not do the books front and back? And this is my thing because I want to have a place to write notes on this part because I didn't leave you a lot of space. And then it is my hope that you can grab this and wherever you store your books, this goes with your book and you can pull it out and you can go through and see. And I, I'm hoping that it is a, a helpful resource for you. All right, let's pray and we're done. Father God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for everything you bless us with. Help us to trust you and trust what your word says. Uh, thank you for salvation that comes through Christ alone. Thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit that, that sanctifies, that convicts, that presses down upon us as it wakes us up to, to who you are, who we are, and what your Son has done. Uh, again, help this to be a helpful study. Help it to drive us to praise God, to praise you more, and to see what your Son has done for us. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Right. So next time we do session two and three, I mean what?